Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. So we are in our course, quantum transport. And today is uh, the last lecture. We will see each other at least one uh, time uh, on a problem solving session. And there, I guess I will also summarize the course and uh, get your feedback in addition to explanations of the homework. Okay, but that's to come. Today is the last lecture. This will be, as you see from the title, about dissipation, decoherence, dephasing. For most of the course, we've been talking about electrons as waves, paying little attention to the processes which uh, make them more classical, whereby they lose energy and lose uh, coherence of their quantum mechanical phase. So it is uh, proper in the last lecture, outline uh, them, it is valid, at which uh, time and length scales, and what are the mechanisms, what are the processes, which are responsible for dissipation, decoherence, and dephasing. Uh, fine, the, pl the plan is as follows. To start with, we look at classical physics and we will understand uh, what is uh, dissipation and uh, decoherence in classical systems. That will give us the uh, proper basis to understand what are the processes uh, the training uh, phase changes and energy changes in quantum mechanics. Good. In any, any case, uh, if you um, lose energy or um, change the phase, uh, then it is interaction with some external quantum modes with environments. So you'll talk about environments. Uh, we will look at manifestations of um, dissipation and decoherence for qubit uh, uh, first, and then we turn to electrons. So it is manifested differently for discrete states, qubits, and for continuums of states where electron waves are propagating. Interestingly, we will uh, figure out that um, uh, light with noise, uh, a noise uh, which is uh, produced uh, in electric circuits, um, frequently uh, determines, uh, defines as a scale of uh, decoherence for electrons in the circuit. And uh, in the end, I uh, will turn to the experiments. Of course, it's always some theory, but experiments can, um, well, basically they confirm theory uh, um, if theory is not crazy, but experiments also bring some new elements. Uh, and uh, that's also the case here. So I will outline a couple of, uh, I would say, classic experiments in uh, dephasing and relaxation. So that is the plan for today. Let me see. Okay, let's start with classical physics. Good. I said it many times and uh, I believe I'm not only passing saying is uh, in the course of your uh, training that um, 
I deal quant I deal Newton mechanics uh, is very strange and idealized um, uh, scheme, right? So in ideal Newton uh, mechanics, uh, classical mechanics, we have energy conservation and also we have time reversibility uh, in, in, in a sense that any motion by proper change of initial conditions can be can be um, uh, transformed to a reverse motion. Uh, well, uh, we know that it's not uh, what we see in the real world that that uh, is in striking constant contrast with experimental reality. In the real world, we have um, friction. Uh, all right, so here's a picture which illustrates uh, the difference between uh, ideal Newtonian oscillator, which is red line. You um, give some bus to the oscillator and it becomes to oscillate. And the amplitude of oscillations just uh, stays the same, owing uh, to energy conservation. Uh, in fact, uh, what is uh, what you see is um, green line. Oscillations are uh, damped, so the oscillator loses energy and finally stops uh, because of the friction. But then, in this age, many mechanisms of uh, this friction. Uh, in any case, it must be interaction with outer degrees of freedom. Um, oscillator should give the energy to, to something by virtue of energy conservation. Uh, there must be some uh, degrees of freedom which will absorb this energy, right? Um, but my microscopic origin can be very different. Um, what shall I say? It is good to uh, characterize the intensity of dissipation by some characteristic time, which can be um, uh, smaller or larger than period of oscillation. So it's a good oscillator or a big oscillator. But anyway, there's some finite time at which the oscillator will lose its energy. This is uh, dissipation, and I don't think anybody has a problem with this. Um, let me talk about the coherence in um, uh, quantum mechanics. It's also a simple topic, but uh, yeah, usually it's not uh, discussed that much in uh, uh, courses of physics. Um, let me pretend that uh, there is no energy uh, loss or whatever. If energy loss persists, something, something will, will uh, uh, keep the amplitude of the oscillations, All right? Like uh, it can be kind of in any generator or, or of um, uh, oscillations or in any um, um, system like a clock, for instance. Yeah, if you recall pendulum clock, it uh, kind of uh, ticks uh, all the time. There must be a little better somewhere, right? Um, good. Uh, so there is no uh, dissipation in the sense that the amplitude of oscillations does not change. However, um, there is there must be some fluctuations of uh, frequency. Now, uh, frequency might depend on whatever parameters, uh, pressure, temperature, a stress and these quantities can fluctuate, resulting in fluctuations of frequency. 
So one could say, well, that uh, the frequency is average frequency plus some addition which fluctuates in time. Uh, and even if this um, change is small, it might result in a big change of the phase of the uh, of oscillations. So phase memory uh, uh, can be completely lost, right? The problem is that fluctuation of the phase as a response on this um, on this um, uh, fluctuations of frequencies uh, grows with time. Why? Because uh, 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 what is the phase? It's integral over frequency. So changes. Um, of uh, frequency are accumulated in phase. Uh, I could write a formula. I don't know what, but that uh, I guess I will write it some, so, so somewhat later in uh, in uh, in this lecture. Uh, right. So even small fluctuations uh, of uh, frequency sooner or later will result in uh, the coherence. In uh, the um, in, in losing the face uh, memory, okay. I, I just illustrated uh, it with uh, um, two oscillations that have slightly different frequency, and as we see, at small times, um, two oscillations uh, are more or less the same, but after some time. There is some, there is, uh, they just uh, in uh, opposite phases, so uh, the phase difference becomes big. Okay, so how we uh, can um, quantify it a bit, how we can uh, describe, give, give a measure to this um, decahumes process. Oh, we, can, we can say as follows. We, we've been talking about correlator of uh, amplitudes that we can rewrite as a correlator of the phases. And then if we average it, what we will find here is exponents. And here, the fluctuation of the phase. Uh, of the phase is separated by a time interval t. Good, it is proportional to t, right? So uh, by dimensions, uh, that proportionality, let me rewrite this formula here, should come with some time. What stays in the exponent must be dimensionless. So we see that uh, phase fluctuations are forgotten at a typical time scale. Let me call it to phi. Good, is there any, any questions uh, or whatever comments, please, uh, please um, uh, write it to me to the chat. Good, so dissipation, decoherence, uh, in principle, different processes in, um, in uh, classical physics. Well, as a, well, if I plot this curve, it looks, looks about the same. Although amplitude sta stays constant, uh, owing to uh, phase lost. Um, you see that uh, the correlator is eventually damped. Uh, the concrete time dependence um, of the decay of the correlator um, indeed depends um, 
on the um, spectral properties uh, of the noise. I will talk a bit later about, about uh, this. It's more about spectral properties uh, of the noise rather than uh, it's uh, kind of um, shape or intensity. Uh, here, I assume the simplest situation, which is uh, pretty generic, that um, these fluctuations are independent at some large time scale. If they're independent, we have the situation of so-called white noise. White noise, you must have heard about this in uh, whatever from electronics courses, which corresponds to completely independent uh, fluctuations um, at any time scale. So, uh, you're right, so there can be different time dependencies of the scalator. This is given for the case of uh, white noise. Uh, fine. And uh, yeah, about the being Gaussian, um, one can say all noises are Gaussians, but uh, it. Um, Most of all noises are Gaussians. Um, and, uh, but the, the spectral properties, intensity of the noise as function frequency, indeed affects the shape of the scalator. Um, fine. Uh, let us see where we now. Right. Uh, yet another uh, manifestation of the coherence in uh, quantum physics. Oh, sorry, in classical physics. Um, let me consider the following. We take uh, oscillators which frequencies which do not fluctuate, but um, there are many of such oscillators, and the frequencies are a bit different. All right, so the frequencies are in a narrow integral interval uh, around omega naught. Uh, here I plot uh, uh, kind of oscillations from all these oscillators, so there are plenty of them. And as earlier, small changes of phase actually lead that uh, the phases at large times uh, are very different for these oscillators. Uh, now let us sum up the signal of all oscillators. Right. That's a kind of uh, can be the case uh, of uh, whatever um, systems containing many particles. Each particle is an oscillator. Uh, right, the, the, uh, and what we see is a sum of signals from all the particles. Uh, in this case, we will also see uh, a decay of the signal as a function of time, although each individual signal still um, goes to the same amplitude, the sum uh, decays in time as if uh, they were dissipation. A uh, typical time of the decay in this case will be, yeah, will be, uh, yeah, I call it H here, uh, will be determined by um, interval of uh, fluctuating frequency. Uh, talking about time dependencies, since uh, Sasha. Uh, he has mentioned this. In this case, uh, indeed, uh, time dependence of the calculator will be different. Uh, it will be rather t squared mm. something like that. But L, 
well, it will decay anyway. Good, these two examples that uh, demonstrate that, uh, at least in classical physics, the, the coherence is uh, a different process from dissipation. Although, kind of visibly, it uh, might be uh, indistinguished, uh, the same decay of uh, curvature. Uh, and uh, there's a variety of uh, mechanisms which can lead to the coherence. Fine, that's about uh, classical physics. That's supposed to be comprehensive examples. If you uh, have a difficulty to comprehend, uh, it's my fault, so please come to me now. All right, everything is clear. Then let me go to quantum transports and let us define what we will, uh, um, how do we think regard dissipation or decoherence in that uh, field. Uh, first of all, uh, we are working with uh, quantum states, they have, which have a certain energy. So if uh, we have dissipation, this is a transition between some quantum states. Well, these states can be discrete, like uh, in qubits, there are two states, uh, discrete states, and dissipation would be, would correspond to transition between these two states. Or it can be continuous, electrons can form continuous spectrum, uh, and uh, right, it uh, can lose continuous amount of energy, um, so the environment uh, can be different, but in any case, it can be characterized by some typical time of energy loss. Uh, uh, Tardy. Uh, right. Uh, and uh, how about the coherence? Uh, and uh, I should say that it's a bit the coherence and the phasing um, is frequently means uh, just the same. Uh, but it uh, turns out that we uh, that when we talk about qubits, we mostly talk about decoherence. While if we talk about electrons, they frequently use the term dephasing. In any case, what happens uh, is that the phase is spoiled somehow. But which phase? Okay, in quantum mechanics, it's a very certain phase. This is the phase of wave function. Uh, right, uh, good. So what about uh, decoherence? That can happen between uh, discrete states uh, of qubits, uh, which are at different energies. For instance, one can uh, try to make superpositions of these qubits, by, uh, of these qubit states like the, um, look a bit with, uh, you know, resonant manipulation. Um, we will connect them at different energies to get some uh, oscillations. Uh, these oscillations are suppressed by decoherence, by changes of uh, quantum mechanical phase between these two discrete states. Uh, okay, but uh, there can be also a change um, of uh, the phases between uh, electron states uh, at the same energy, like we uh, had, we, we've been talking about uh, a Ronom bomb effect, and what happens are uh, two electron waves at the same energy they do interfere. The phasing also breaks. Uh, are going to have a bomb effect, suppresses these oscillations, uh, so oscillations of electrons at the same energy. 
Good. Uh, this is uh, what we have uh, in quantum transport. I also put here uh, a rather um, Uh, I also put here a relation which might look strange, but in fact, uh, it's rather easy to comprehend. Uh, who has an idea? How does it come about? What is written here in words is that the time required for dissipation is uh, larger than the time required for dephasing. If there is dissipation, then there will also be dephasing, uh, but not the other way around. So uh, if stuff dissipates, it also def dephases. That's why the characteristic def uh, dephasing time is smaller. Right, something of the kind. Uh, I would say, put it like this, if, uh, um, if we turn, turn back to a, a damped oscillator, if oscillations are gone at, um, the, uh, at, the, uh, at the time of dissipation, then you don't have phase either. Phase must be gone, right? But in another example, we have uh, um, oscillators with the same amplitude. So somehow there were no dissipation effectively, but they exhibit uh, phase loss, the phase in. That's why we have such a relation, which, which, is, uh, which holds in general. The phase in can be of the same order than uh, dissipation, but it uh, never can be uh, uh, less intensive the dissipation. Uh, fine. Uh, let us see how we can proceed. Uh, let's us understand it in more quantum mechanical form at the level of uh, Hamiltonians. I don't want you to scare with uh, writing this Hamiltonian set explicitly. Uh, let's us um, just use some general knowledge about uh, matrix elements of a Hamiltonian, diagonal, non-diagonal. Uh, right. Uh, I should say that uh, although dissipation and the uh, uh, phasing are separate phenomena, um, they should be described in the framework of uh, same model. Uh, why is it so? Because a boss come from the environment. So the model must be uh, a model of interaction between some quantum system and the environment. This system can be qubit or an electron which flies in a quantum transport device. Um, and environment is something different. Environment for one electron could be, for instance, other electrons as well. Um, well let us let us uh, just sketch uh, what we can have in general. So this is um, Hamiltonian of the system. So we have states of the system labeled by N, and uh, we have environment, some modes labeled by K. Number kind of um, number of these modes is uh, at the same energy is kind of should be bigger that number of this mode modes. Um, and let us see what is interaction. Interaction is a term in Hamiltonian which comes with matrix element, which uh, changes this state, which mixes up the state. 
All right. And uh, for instance, I can have elements which are diagonal in uh, N. What does it mean? Uh, this is a, a process whereby uh, the system is, uh, remains in the same state, but something has changed in the environment. There's still some interaction with the environment. Or it could be non diagonal. When uh, you have a change in the, the system and also the change in the environment. Fine. Uh, then, uh, what is dissipation and what is uh, decoherence? Well, dissipation uh, corresponds to transitions, right? So energy must be changed. Uh, so there must be a transition to different energy. That's why it's about non-diagonal elements. As to decoherence. Uh, it looks like fluctuations of energy differences. Why is it so? Because in quantum mechanics, in quantum mechanics, frequencies are energy differences. Uh, and uh, if we just consider um, diagonal um, element of this kind, it will describe uh, the fluctuation of energy so that the uh, fluctuations of uh, frequency of a given state, uh, state n. All right. Some general uh, argumentation to, 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 to help us uh, to build a more concrete model of such interaction. <clears throat> so let's make more concrete model and we will um, talk about uh, a qubit these two states plus and minus we need an environment and uh, we kind of borrow an environment from a previous lecture from uh, lecture uh, 11 uh, when um, we've been talking mostly about electric circuits, uh, but yeah, uh, there are uh, fluctuations and oscillations in uh, electric circuits. It is a ready to use uh, example of uh, an environment. Uh, fine. So, environment is a set of bosons in this case, uh, and um, we can uh, write interaction with. Uh, environment as interaction with bosons. Good. Uh, what we are interested in. Uh, first, uh, about the terms which uh, give uh, the coherence. Here they are. If you look attentively, what comes here are uh, terms diagonal qubit states. So uh, this is actually energy difference between these two states. Right, it has some um, value without fluctuations, plus it has fluctuations, well, corresponding to <laughs> frequency uh, fluctuations we have dis uh, discussed in the beginning. Uh, all right, this uh, fluctuation can be written as a, yeah, in terms of these bosons. Uh, then dissipation, uh, I don't want to introduce yet another operator in boson models. I would use just the same, but I would put it with different coefficient, of the order one perhaps, which will um, um, account for the fact that it is uh, still different process. Eh? Different process because as we see here, it causes transitions between two qubit states. Uh, well, I need to characterize this fluctuation somehow. And the parameter which I would uh, use is a spectral 
density of these energy fluctuations. Uh, right, I um, would consider general situation with non-zero temperature, so this um, um, there can be some uh, ground quantum noise, even at zero, and uh, uh, energy characterizing these fluctuations. And if the uh, temperature, then uh, fluctuation dissipation theorem tells us that uh, it uh, affects the spectrum as uh, shown. Uh, right, what does it mean if uh, temperature is sufficiently high? We can replace it by T divided by H omega. So as a result, will be proportional to temperature. That will be thermal fluctuations. Like, for instance, in uh, most uh, realistic circuits, at least at room temperature, uh, noise is uh, all is due to some of fluctuations. Um, fine. So we have environment, which can be characterized by spectral uh, density of these fluctuations. There could be very many things in the environment, but the qubit doesn't care about this variety of things. There can be whatever. Uh, pink unicorns uh, flying around. Uh, that does not uh, matter for this qubit. It looks uh, 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 only at this operator with which it is coupled to the environment. It's the only, only information about the environment the qubit can receive. Fine, so let us uh, look at the conclusions. Dissipation. Dissipation. Uh, what will happen? Well, uh, if uh, there is an uh, um, upper state uh, and the down state, what can happen if you initially have the system in upper state? There can be a transition down with energy loss. Uh, right, so initially it is a state plus, and finally it's the state. Uh, uh, minus and uh, one boson is flying in the environment. Uh, fine, you can take it and compute it uh, uh, with Fermi Golden Rule. And uh, what we get, we have actually spectral density of the noise, spectral density of the noise at the frequency which corresponds to the uh, energy difference, right? Because uh, it's a frequency at which the boson is emitted. Uh, good, if uh, this final temperature, one has to take into account that there are processes uh, which also thermally excite the qubit. And uh, the ratio between the rates uh, must be such that um, in um, in um, that uh, the qubit um, should be in thermal equilibrium. Uh, the probabilities um, to be in upper and, low and lower states must differ by uh, Boltzmann weight. Uh, let me write it explicitly. Um, what is this? Let's recall statistics. It's a Boltzmann weight exponent minus the energy difference is uh, delta. Delta divided by KBT. Right. If you recognize that the rate should reproduce this, we find that the energy should be proportional to um, the factors which uh, come from uh, both Einstein statistics. Right, that's about dissipation of the qubit and kind of bottom line is that it is selective in frequency. 
picks up uh, picks up picks up spectral noise at certain frequency. Uh, how to understand the decoherence? Oh uh, well, let us first uh, understand decoherence, uh, which can be brought by uh, classical things rather than apparatus. Well, suppose uh, usually we want to do something with the qubits. The qubits must be manipulated. So there must be some control signals whereby we manipulate the system. Uh, right, for instance, we could uh, control energy difference by changing some parameter. But at the same time, if we open up a control channel, there must be some noise coming in the channel. It's inevitable. Uh, good, uh, so there's some noise, and let me first assume that it's white noise. Let me now um, understand the um, reaction of the qubit on this noise. Well, the phase of the qubit, time depend, into time derivative of the phase of the qubit is just energy. Right, so that will be phase change. I integrate all this over energy. Okay, that leads to this expressions for fluctuation of the phase difference uh, separated by time interval. I wonder if I have to talk about this formula or is it evident? In principle, it's not. So let me talk a little bit about this formula, <laughs> just to make it a bit mathematical. Good, so this is the phase change accumulated by integration from zero to T. I integrate over some time, time prime, energy dependent on time prime. Good, so now I want to compute the um, fluctuation. And to this end, first I have to square this integral. Good, then as a result of squaring with what I have, I have two integrals, integrals, integral over two times. And let me see if that comes with T prime, and that comes with T T prime. Fine. Now I want to average, I want to uh, replace it by a delta function over time. And the uh, time's noise. Good, I do this. This delta function kills one of the integrations. And now the integration remains. So the answer is proportional to time interval. All right, everybody understands this. That's also what I mentioned um, uh, in the first slide without uh, giving the explicit formula. Fine. So that's what we have for fluctuation. So it's the, the, uh, what matters here. Strangely enough, is um, spectral intensity at zero frequency, not at the frequency of transition, but well, at zero frequency. Uh, fine, with this, we can estimate the phase and time. Look, it depends on noise intensity. The more noise, the more intensive noise we have, uh, the shorter the dephasing time is. Fine, uh, let's see what do we have uh, on time axis. Uh, okay, I guess it's uh, time to have a break. Let's have uh, just uh, seven minutes break. Let's try seven minutes break. I will uh, stop the recording.
Good. So we go on with our lecture. What we have fig figured out that um, um, external noise, which comes for, for instance from a control channel, causes the phasing of the qubit. The dephasing time is inversely proportional to the intensity of the noise, and uh, it is uh, picked up at zero frequency. The intensity, the spectral um, intensity, looks has to be taken at zero frequency. Mm -hmm. um, there is a small trick with this. which I would like to explain now. But somehow, bit, that's classical noise. But uh, with me, the environment does uh, the same, uh, provided uh, uh, the uh, uh, frequencies are smaller than temperature in energy units. Because in this case, the, the um, uh, because in this case, uh, the um, fluctuations are classical, uh, uh, somebody, The noise is not quantum, it's just, uh, it just uh, the same as uh, classical noise. And frequencies which are smaller than, um, than uh, uh, temperature in frequency units. Uh, good, uh, that um, um, inverse dephasing time should be of the order of frequencies involved. And uh, that also implies that the phasing time, inverse the phasing time, or the phasing frequency, I can say, should be smaller than temperature. If it is otherwise, something goes very wrong. The defasing is too large. And we will see. Um, an example when yeah when uh, we will when it really goes go goes wrong and there's no quantum mechanics remaining. So we should keep to this uh, and um, let us see let us figure out um, what are actually uh, frequencies of the noise which are important for dephasing. Uh, just no, it seems there's no uh, answer. The, the answer is clear. We have provided it, it's a zero frequency. But it's good that if uh, frequency dependence of, uh, of uh, 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 the spectral intensity is somehow smoothed, uh, if there's not, is there no, is there no interesting things happening at zero frequency? Um, if it does, one has to think about this, think more about this. And what is the result of this thinking? The phasing by itself gives some frequency scale. Right, one over tau f is a frequency. And if uh, the noise depends on the frequency at this frequency scale, we just need to take the intensity of the noise at this frequency. So I have the following equation. This is uh, suitable for colored environment. Colored um, means opposition to white. So the noise in this environment uh, doesn't go to finite limit if frequency goes to zero. 
and then it's not uh, it, it does not give one over tau phi directly rather it's an equation to solve self consistency to define one over tau f let us do it and we will assume that in general noise at low frequency is proportional to temperature no? um, as we say we, we discuss thermal noise and to some power of frequency good so we substituted to the equation and for different um, uh, for whatever power we have uh, a result one over tau f is proportional to temperature to, uh, to, 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 to some other power so what are different powers and how they distinguish different types of physics Noise can be subomic in the sense that this exponent can be negative. And in this case, there's a danger at low temperature. So that at low temperatures, one tau f becomes comparable with, becomes eventually bigger than temperature. So there was some danger. Uh, if uh, noise is ohmic, then the noise, if the environment is ohmic, then the, um, uh, we have, then we have light noise and one tau f is just proportional to temperature. Uh, there are also different uh, regimes for positive S to super ohmic regimes. If S is kind of smaller than one, we have um, um, this temperature dependence uh, of uh, one to F, and it is fine. There is no danger at low temperatures. And there's also another superomic regime where eventually one to F is zero decoherence is incomplete which means that some phase memory will persist in uh, in the same environment till 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 um, infinity good so this is classification of different environments well ohmic environment as i said is the most uh, common one corresponding to white noise uh, let me shortly mention what is um, what happens in sub ohmic regime, and uh, I also mentioned the, in the course of quantum mechanics. Uh, I guess in principle, it is the same uh, context, but a bit different way of explaining this. Um, in this case. Um, the qubit is no qubit anymore. In that case, it is similar to classical particle. Quantum mechanics is gone. One cannot make uh, quantum superpositions of two states. Rather, you put it, it, it in one of the states and it will stay there forever. So um, if we submerge a qubit into subomic environment, it will become a classical memory cell. Quantum mechanics is gone. Uh, fine, that was about qubit. I believe that's, that's uh, everything what I wanted to say about the qubit. And uh, let me now switch to electrons to quantum transport in nanostructures from one terminal to another terminal. And let me get back uh, to a topic which we discussed at least once. Um, we have two junctions and uh, something in between. 
uh, and uh, we apply voltage and we would like to understand uh, what can be inside. What would be filling factor in this node as a function of energy? First scenario corresponds to elastic transport. In this case, electrons which uh, go through a nanostructure just have no time to dissipate. Okay, it's uh, kind of funny. Uh, of course, they lose energy, but um, uh, sooner or later. But that will happen somewhere in the lead and it would not affect the transport whatsoever. While in the nanostructure, they just don't have time to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, is there, so as I said, dwell, dwell time, uh, tau V, tau W, um, uh, to uh, characterize this. Dwell time is short, no dissipation. In this case, what we see in the middle, it's just a superposition of two filling factors. So there's a step in filling factor in one lead and another lead. And if you look in between, you see two steps. All right. Everybody understands this. We will see them, these two steps in experiment. Uh, close to the end of the lecture. What is um, another scenario? Uh, in this case, we will have uh, some very long structure. So electrons interact with each, with each other while in the structure. So dissipation uh, time is shorter than the dwell time. Uh, what will happen is they would uh, interact and they would um, uh, assume some uh, Fermi distribution. So instead of two steps, even at zero temperature of the environment, there will be smooth distribution, smooth function with temperature. Uh, which is uh, uh, roughly defined by voltage, some effective temperature. Um, it's uh, when dissipation happens inside the structure. If we somehow manage to um, dissipate uh, outside very efficiently, then uh, we will also have um, zero temperature in uh, inside. And this uh, the temperature would not have any uh, traces, like here, any traces of the chemical potential in the um, reservoirs. Uh, because the dissipation has happened. Good, that are manifestations of dissipation. Uh, how about uh, manifestations of dephasing? Uh, we have shortly mentioned, in fact, this uh, when we talk about uh, weak localization. Let me remind it. First, um, uh, let us understand that um, time scale also implies length scale for electrons in a nanostructure, right? This length scale is a uh, length at which electron would diffuse during this time interval. So how to say that? We have uh, our own of bomb effect, we made a loop so there can be interference of, uh, for instance, this trajectory and this trajectory, which makes a, a loop around um, uh, 
which makes a loop inside uh, 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 inside some flux. Uh, right, so what we expect uh, if the lens of the structure is smaller than this uh, L phi, there must be coherence of this oscillation, so the value, the coherence is gone. All right, this is some manifestation. We can make um, um, a run of bomb effect structure. Them affect this lens, for instance, change in temperature. So phi depends on temperature, so the lens is affected. And you see that uh, oscillations will die if you increase temperature. Um, or weak localization. Uh, in this case, we don't have uh, definite uh, loops like in quantum Hall effect. But okay, trajectories uh, make uh, loops of different size. Um, and uh, magnetic field. Um, kind of singles out typical size of this loop. So loops at which um, magnetic field provides one quantum define uh, the lens scale, the typical lens scale, which depends on magnetic field. Uh, all right, that lens scale can be comparable with, um, with a um, lens scale of, um, the phasing, right? And uh, that eventually can be seen experimentally. If one measures um, the small correction, weak localization correction as a function of magnetic field, the width of the peak or deep in the correction defines defines uh, dephasing. Uh, if magnetic field is uh, of the order of this width, um, magnetic field dependent lens is of the order of um, decoherent, decoherence lens. Uh, fine, those are Again, manifestations, how to see dissipation or dephasing in an experiment. Now I will be talking about mechanisms. Uh, there's plenty of mechanisms, uh, so the discussion will be a bit lengthy. lengthy. Um, let me first uh, talk about uh, traditional uh, mechanisms of dissipation. Usually, uh, electrons in solids interact most of all with uh, phonons. Even at uh, room temperature, even the resistance uh, is uh, defined by interaction with phonons. At low temperatures, the resistance is mostly um, due to scattering as impurities, as the effects, defects in solids. Uh, also, the interaction, the dissipation due to emission of phonon uh, scales uh, as a third power of um, uh, effective electron energy. Uh, this is due to um, the fact that there are the less the energy of the phonons, the less uh, phonons we have. Density of uh, phonons goes down uh, as a function of energy. Uh, what does it mean? It means that below 1k, say, interaction with phonons become irrelevant. Uh, phonons usually go out of the structure, they don't stay in that structure, so this is uh, the case of dissipation which goes outside. 
All right, that's one mechanism. Another mechanism is uh, electron-electron interaction, electron-electron scattering. Uh, let me present very uh, kind of heuristic uh, analysis of this effect, um, which uh, kind of uh, um, starts a bit strange. Uh, but I will say that the way electrons feel each other is an electric field, right? Electric field uh, fluctuates and thereby, uh, yeah, provides an environment for electron to uh, put energy in. Uh, right. Uh, what? How we can characterize these fluctuations? You know that fluctuations in electric circuits are proportional to the resistance. Voltage fluctuations are proportional to the resistance. Uh, right. So that's how we can come to estimation of inverse dissipation rate. By dimension, it has to be proportional to the energy, electron energy. Then the dimension is factor, has to be proportional to the resistance. Okay. To make in dimension is we use our old friend. You remember, it appears in every lecture of this course, conductance quantum. Fine, but we don't know um, at which uh, scale this resistance uh, has to be taken. And it turns out it depends on the structure geometry and effective uh, uh, dimensionality at this particular lens. Uh, right. So the lens, which plays a role here in dissipation, can be derived from the fact that energy frequency of this dissipation process is of the order of temperature. We put it to diffusion equation, we got a diffusive lens. So the idea that the dissipation yeah, is somehow given by resistance at this uh, length scale. About geometry, it is very different. Suppose we have a, a thin nanowire, then the resistance which we encounter here will be proportional to the length, will be proportional to LT. If we have two-dimensional uh, nanostructure, all right, the resistance uh, would not depend on the size. And for 3D, it will be uh, even inversely proportional to the, to the size. So uh, in fact, it's, uh, it's where um, scientists uh, um, got uh, a bit, uh, uh, got uh, something which they could not imagine. Uh, well, uh, in solid state physics, usually uh, all these uh, characteristics uh, are material properties which do not depend on the way you shape the material. But it turns out that at sufficiently low temperature, you see the dependence on the geometry. Because a rather long landscape comes to the definitions of uh, these, uh, these um, observables. Right? So dissipation happens at rather long um, 
uh, uh, time uh, run scale, and that can be seen by measuring dissipation in uh, nanostructures of different groups. Okay, electron lecton scattering as a mechanism. Uh, how about uh, mechanisms of the phasing? Uh, as we discussed, anything which causes dissipation also causes the phasing. So, phonons is also a possible mechanism. Electron electron interactions uh, come also similar, and in this case, electron electron interactions come in the form of classical Nyquist noise. And we will uh, talk a little bit uh, further about this. Um, strange effect, which actually um, would not um, become a subject of attention to theorists, but um, mostly it was uh, discovered by experimentalists is that uh, spin effect effect can affect the phasing and as you see can even determine this dephasing in large extent. Uh, let me explain why that so because a spin uh, in uh, quantum mechanics is also a sort of phase right so there are two wave functions uh, for like, um, two component wave function for electron like, spin up, spin down, and the interference between these two actually defines the direction of spin. So if you change the phase between the uh, components of spin uh, of different spins, you change the, uh, the, the spin. Vice versa, if you change spin you will uh, kill interference, uh, you will affect interference uh, of these waves. Um, there are two mechanisms related to spin. First, spin orbit scattering. We shortly discuss it when we discuss weak localization. And that causes some change of interference pattern on a, a length scale. Um, given by uh, intensity and spin orbit interaction. But it does not kill interference completely, it only changes its properties. What will kill interference, what will cause the, the ultimate dephasing is a scattering at stray magnetic impurities. Uh, in this case, uh, you change the state of this impurity while scattering, so you transfer quantum information, phase information to the impurity, and this is lost. So that's why it is also a mechanism of the phasing. Good. Uh, let me talk about uh, voltage noise. It's rather instructive and simple formula. Uh, let me first uh, take something from um, another course you might follow. And my question, if you recall this formula from some other course in your education. In my opinion, you should, but well, uh, things happen. You can recall this formula. Must be some systems and signals, perhaps, or uh, something else, some electronic course. No.
um, who has been taking system and, uh, systems and signals. Nobody? Uh, three years ago, yes, okay. Uh, have you been talking about noises? Thermal noises, turbine noises, filter noise, I have no idea what is this. Okay, you, one, one can filter noise which exists, yes. Not kinds of noises. Jesus Christ. Interesting also in uh, statistical physics, uh, did you talk about the noises, thermal noises? No? Interesting generation, you yeah. are. I shall acquire how could it happen? Uh, yeah, I, I guess uh, a couple of years ago, I, I had no problem with this um, formula. Look, uh, you take a resistor, whatever resistor you take it from the box, box, it has a nominal of say one ohm. We have certain temperature. And then the voltage noise at the end of this resistor. It's by general relations, uh, relating response functions and fluctuations, this noise uh, depends only on temperature and resistance. No other parameters are involved. This noise is proportional to temperature and at sufficiently low frequencies, it's right noise. One could make kind of uh, nice experiments uh, amplifying this uh, noise change in temperature of uh, the resistor and see uh, how this noise fades away if temperature gets lower. Uh, fine. Uh, and this is called, uh, has a name tag attached to it, it's called Josephson Nyquist noise or sometimes Nyquist noise. Uh, right. So let us compute phase change due to this noise, due to this voltage, right? Fluctuating voltage. So the phase, uh, yeah, it's uh, voltage times uh, charge, right? Now we can use the same formula which we have derived. Phase fluctuations are proportional to time. Proportionality coefficient is uh, the resistor and temperature. And that's what we get for Dickerhion's time. So this is proportional to temperature, like for Romicola law, and proportional to the resistor, to the resistance. Now uh, let us see uh, what resistance shall we take? Okay, if you just have a single resistor, it's okay, but suppose we have a nanostructure. Then again, the same geometric consideration applies. And thus, uh, this funny self-consistency too. If structure is one dimension now, uh, which means that this dimension is smaller than L5, then it's effectively one dimension and resistor is resistance is proportional to L5. For two dimensions, it doesn't depend uh, roughly on this. And for three dimensions, uh, it's uh, inversely proportional to the length. All right, let us now apply this. Let us figure out what uh, would be one over L5 for different geometries due to Nyquist noise. 
uh, fine. We do it for one dimensions. So here I substituted the resistance, uh, uh, here the lens, okay. I have an equation to solve. A resulting uh, uh, result gives me one over tau phi proportional to the temperature, the power two thirds. It's actually subomic, but one has to go to very low temperatures to figure that out. Uh, as to uh, 2D, well, it's ohmic, so the phasing rate is proportional to temperature. With a small coefficient, which is uh, uh, sheet resistance of the system in units of um, uh, times uh, times um, conductance function. In three dimension, it does not make such se much sense. Such uh, estimation, accurate estimation, tells well in this uh, in this case um, it is defined by dissipation. Dissipation we know. It's three to half, so we are in superromic regime. Um, in three dimensions. Fine. Okay, let's see how much time do I have. I still have 15 minutes, sir. I can um, tell you a bit about uh, interesting and uh, to some extent fundamental experiments uh, made uh, about uh, noise and the phasing. I should say that it's not only experiments. There have been uh, hundreds of experiments made uh, uh, in this field. I just pick up some which I liked and uh, which I uh, see um, is a really a, a, a top with respect to um, intellectual content and uh, experimental realizations. Good, experiment on the phasing. What do they have? They made uh, a wire from silver. Rather simple uh, nanostructure um, in uh, modern, uh, at the modern technology. Uh, that's eventually pretty long land scale, uh, land scale. The intention was to make a pretty long wire. I guess in total it's uh, about uh, almost one millimeter wire, but it's made kind of meandering. Um, and the uh, um, uh, this. Uh, lens at which uh, face is broken, or appears to be measured uh, to be like uh, pretty big, like 20, 20 micrometers uh, on the rudder of uh, this um, um, meander loop. Fine. How do they do this? How do they measure it? What they do, they measure the resistance of the wire as a function of magnetic field. Well, what they see is a peak, uh, sorry, small peak, uh, it is a resistance, so there's a dip in resistance, which is due to, um, which is due to weak uh, localization. The this of this peak in magnetic field determines, as we um, discussed, this uh, L of pi, and not, if you know the fusion coefficient, you can extract time. You can extract the phasing time. Uh, there is a difference uh, between the plots, and okay, it says five and six, and I will tell you later uh, what is this five and six. Um, let us uh, look at the plot. So they do it at the different temperature and they see something, they see dependence of uh, tau phi on the um, uh, temperature. Well, if temperature is bigger than 1K, they uh, see that it uh, drops pretty fast as a function of temperature. 
and uh, all right, it's not set, interesting. It's uh, four knots. Uh, there is a large interval of time. It's basically double locked plots, so all power laws are lines in this scale. Then you see this dependence, which we have just derived from Nyquist noise. So it should work. It uh, shows experimental, uh, seem to show experimental um, verification. Uh, the trouble uh, kind of uh, hell opens up if you go to yet lower temperatures. Look, in this case, you see clear saturation of uh, the phasing rate in the limit of zero temperature. That's the way to interpret this result. So that's how um, that's how uh, Nyquist uh, noise would go without any saturation as a line, and here you see the saturation. If you take the saturation seriously, uh, your brain gets damaged, and that was uh, to uh, say, to put it frankly. Uh, a case of uh, several dozens of physicists by the time. Um, why it is equivalent to, 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 to brain damage? Um, non zero dephasing at zero temperature would imply that something is going on just in the ground state, in the ground unique quantum mechanical state. But if it's if something causes device in just in the in a single quantum state, something is wrong with mere quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics uh, does not work. So this experimental result, which has been also observed in many groups, uh, was kind of, uh, yeah, was brain damaging. You began to doubt uh, quantum mechanics, whichever. And this particular experiment, uh, which I, uh, um, I'm discussing, uh, gave a clear answer to this paradox. As you see, uh, there are different curves given different degree of saturation. And the difference between different curves are materials with different number of magnetic impurities. So it is uh, the same silver but it's been um, bought from different chemists and had different number of magnetic impurities. Uh, they can control this, they can uh, purify the materials up to uh, uh, so this five and six actually the number of nines. Uh, five means 99, nine, nine, nine percent of silver. If you go to six, you have 99, nine, 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 nine percent of silver. And uh, uh, correspondingly, it uh, will cost you about 10 times more. Anyway, there's, uh, there's a very small number, a very small amount of silver. I don't think uh, it was too expensive. For them, so they bought um, silver vials of a different, uh, this different concentration of impurities, and they see that saturation eventually, um, uh, the level of saturation becomes higher and higher if the number of magnetic impurities is uh, smaller. 
those uh, see it and not experiments that yeah, it will uh, increase at um, lower temperatures as it is supposed to go. Uh, good, that was uh, the phasing, was rather a dramatic experiment. Uh, let me also talk about relaxation that has been done by the same group about this time. Let's see if I have time to talk about this. Oh yeah, I had open. Um, they wanna see something which I have already shown uh, you today. They wanted to see the feeling factor with two steps. Okay, so there is a wire biased at uh, some voltage difference. And uh, if there are more inelastic processes in the wire, you expect that at each point of the wire, there is a feeling factor with two steps. For instance, you can look in the middle. Uh, another point, how to detect this. How to detect this. Um, it's not that uh, easy. They detected to turn it into another electrode. That is why. But uh, yeah, if uh, the probability of uh, tunneling doesn't depend on energy, you 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 you, you, don't, you don't see this. You don't see this uh, this feature. Uh, they use a dynamical Coulomb blockade feature, like we described in lecture. Uh, 11, which is uh, pinned at family power, right? Uh, so what does it mean? If you have a single step in feeling factors and measure differential resistance of the structure, perhaps you can recall something of lecture 11, there is a change of conductance or resistance at low voltages. All right. Now, if we have two steps, then we expect this picture to be at bus steps. That's what we want. Uh, that's what one would uh, see if. Uh, if yeah, if sweeping this voltage. And uh, if the feeling factor is smooth, there will be no upper peak, there will be a single peak, which will be somehow smooth. Okay. That's the idea of how to measure energy dependence of the feeling factor in a certain point of the wire. They use sub feature in differential resistance of this tunnel junction, which is due to dynamical Coulomb blockade. Good, so that's what they see. And strange enough, they again see the difference between, uh, they have already the silver material, they can use it in this experiment as well. And what they see, they see clear difference between uh, silvers of uh, different impurity concentration. Right, for very clear silver, they do see Um, feeling factor with two steps, which they can extract from this, um, this uh, measurements of differential resistance. Uh, well, if silver is uh, a bit uh, more dirty, <laughs> look what I see. It's a pretty smooth uh, feeling factor. Pretty smooth energy dependence. 
more corresponding to um, what we discussed to strong electron and electron interaction. They also extracted from measurements. So that was a conclusion which was not uh, predicted by Sears by, by the time, but okay, of course, a Sears can explain everything. They explained it quickly that in the limit of log temperatures, also dissipation is most likely um, due to interaction with stray magnetic impurities. Good. So that was perhaps rather theoretical course, but again, it was not about real theory. It was about concepts uh, of uh, quantum transport. Right. But uh, it is uh, always good to supplement it with experimental material if uh, experiments uh, have high intellectual contents, if they illustrate something. That was it about dissipation, decoherence, and dephasing in quantum transport. That also concludes the lecture part of the course. Let me repeat, we will meet uh, once again. There will be a problem solving session. I've forgotten some day in the beginning of uh, June. Um, I will uh, talk about homework, uh, about uh, the course in general, and I will try to collect some feedback from you. Sure, thank you for your attention. I uh, stopped the lecture and I uh, here for some time for you.